Uh, thanks for inviting me to talk this evening. I'm delighted to be here. At 9 o'clock in the morning, on Tuesday, the 16th of October, 1962, John F. Kennedy was lying in bed reading the newspapers, and his national security advisor, McGeorge Bundy, who'd been a dean at Harvard University but was now working in government, came up to the bedroom in the White House, knocked on the door, went in, and told Kennedy that the CIA had just established that the Soviet Union had deployed nuclear missiles in Cuba. That moment marked the start of the Cuban Missile Crisis, by consensus the most dangerous moment in the history of the Cold War, the closest we've been to uh, a Third World War and possibly uh, uh, an apocalyptic ending of everything. And for the next 13 days, the world teetered on the brink of nuclear war until the 28th of October, when uh, Sunday the 28th of October, by which point John Kennedy and his Soviet counterpart Nikita Khrushchev were able to cut a deal. And uh, so those 13 days, the Cuban Missile Crisis, ha uh, have attracted a huge amount of attention from historians, scholars. Mm -hmm. And what I want to talk about today, really, are two things. The, cr the crisis itself, those 13 days when the world was on the brink of possibly a third world war, but also the background to the crisis. And I think there's one thing that's useful for you to know in terms of the historical debate on the Cuban Missile Crisis and how it's changed, which is if you, if you read early accounts of the Cuban Missile Crisis, books say that were written in the, in the 1960s, they did just focus on those 13 days. And um, there would usually be a chapter devoted to each single day of the crisis, October the 16th, October the 17th, 1962, and so on. And implicit in that approach was an assumption. And the assumption was that there was no meaningful debate to be had on the causes of the Cuban Missile Crisis. They were obvious. The cause was a, uh, a reckless, aggressive decision by Nikita Khrushchev to deploy nuclear missiles in Cuba. That obviously was the primary cause of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so, so there was no worthwhile discussion to be had about that. What's happened in the last 20 or 25 years or so is that scholars have, or many scholars, not all, but many scholars have changed their approach to the Cuban Missile Crisis and have now become, including myself, and have now become as interested in the background to the Cuban mass Missile Crisis as in the crisis itself, as interested in the question of why did the Cuban Missile Crisis happen in the first place, as in the question of how the crisis was managed and diffused. So my talk this evening will, will divide into two. Firstly, the background to the Cuban Missile Crisis, the causes of the Cuban Missile Crisis, and then secondly, the crisis itself. In spring 1962, Nikita Khrushchev, who'd been the Soviet leader since the mid-1950s, was uh, walking along the, the Black Sea coast with his defense minister, Malinovsky. And Malinovsky pointed out to him the fact that across the horizon in Turkey were US nuclear missiles, Jupiter missiles, which could strike the Soviet Union, um, could strike Soviet cities. And Khrushchev reportedly said, well, you know, maybe we can give them a taste of their own medicine by putting missiles in Cuba. And indeed, that was the moment, spring 1962, when Nikita Khrushchev decided to <coughs> deploy nuclear missiles in Cuba. Um, it wasn't as simple as that. He needed to go to Fidel Castro, the Cuban leader, who had been leader of Cuba since 1959, young revolutionary leader, and basically ask his permission. And he did that, and Castro said yes, he was willing to accept deployment of Soviet nuclear missiles on Cuban soil. And the, um, that operation of actually deploying the nuclear missiles in Cuba took place in the summer and the autumn of 1962. It was known as Operation Anadir, and it involved the deployment not only of medium and intermediate range nuclear missiles, so these are nuclear missiles that have a range of 1,000 miles uh, and 2,000 miles, but also large numbers of Soviet troops, actually, over 40,000 Soviet troops were deployed in Cuba, and conventional weapons as well. And it was a highly top, top secret operation. Anadir is a river in the northern part of the Soviet Union. And so for anyone involved in the operation, they, they, they probably assumed that it was to do with somewhere in a northerly area. And all the Soviet military personnel involved were given uh, parkers and skis 
So again, that reinforced. And, the, and the, the ships on which the nuclear missiles were deployed, the captains of those ships didn't know where they were going. They, they were given a set of coordinates uh, in an envelope, and they would go to that part of the sea, and when they got there, they would open an envelope, which would tell them they were going to Cuba. So it's a highly top-secret operation. Now, Khrushchev always maintained that there was, because uh, we have his memoirs, amongst other things, always maintained there was one main reason why he deployed nuclear missiles in Cuba, and that was to defend Cuba from an anticipated US attack authorised by Kennedy. Now, I think for most people, when you know, Khrushchev made that argument, it seemed self-serving. The idea that you know, he put missiles in Cuba as a selfless, altruistic act to help his Cuban ally. He also alluded to a second motive as well, which was to alter the nuclear balance between the superpowers. And indeed, there was a huge nuclear imbalance between the US and the Soviet Union at that point in time, at the start of the 1960s. It's easy when you look back at the Cold War to think of the Soviet Union as being armed to the teeth. But in fact, the strategic reality was that the US had a massive lead in nuclear weapons over the Soviet Union. You, you read different estimates, but probably the best estimates we have is the US had something like 17 times as many nuclear warheads as the Soviet Union in the early 1960s. Now, that, that would ultimately change because later in the 60s, the Soviets would embark on a huge military build-up build up so that by the 1970s, for the first time in the history of the Cold War, the Soviets did have approximate parity with the United States. But at that point in time, in the early 60s, the, the, uh, the US had a huge lead. And so Khrushchev talked about this being a secondary motive, deploying in Cuba nuclear missiles that could strike the United States. These missiles could not strike the United States from Soviet soil, but they could from Cuba, which is just 90 miles off the, off the coast of Florida. Now, you can make the argument, and this is the argument that, that some have made uh, in recent years, you can make the argument that there is a link between the policies that Kennedy carried out in the early part of his presidency, 1961, and early 1962, and those concerns that Khrushchev had about A, the need to defend Cuba, and B, the need to change the nuclear balance. And in a way, to understand all of that, you've got to go back to uh, the late 1930s, actually, and here, London. Because in the late 1930s, John Kennedy, uh, young John Kennedy, who was just in his early 20s, uh, spent a lot of time here in London because his father was amb <coughs> ambassador to Britain. He was a Harvard student at the time, but he became very interested in uh, British politics, British society, and because of that, he decided to write his undergraduate thesis at Harvard on the issue of British foreign policy, and specifically on the question of the British appeasement of Nazi Germany. Uh, his father was ambassador, so he had access to good sources. Uh, he he uh, wrote the dissertation. It was pretty well received at Harvard, and his father used his connections to get it published, and it came out in 1940. The summer of 1940, John Kennedy published a book, his first book, at the age of 23, called, uh, called Why England Slept. The wording was a play on the title of a book by uh, Churchill called Why England Slept. And, you know, you can get that book today still, and you can read it, and you can learn a lot about Kennedy's approach to foreign policy if you read that, that book. Because what Kennedy argued was that the, the basic mistake made by British policymakers in the late 1930s similar to the argument Churchill was making in the political wilderness in the 30s, the, the, the key mistake that British policymakers were making uh, in the 30s was not arming Britain uh, quickly enough in order to meet the Nazi challenge. And the lesson that Kennedy drew from this was that democracies, when dealing with totalitarian states, needed to be strongly armed so that they could deal with those aggressor states from a position of strength. 1946, Kennedy was elected to Congress. He, he takes a seat in Congress in 1947, which is just when the Cold War with the Soviet Union is gathering pace. And what Kennedy does during his 14-year career in Congress is just basically take the logic of this argument he developed in the context of Nazi Germany in the 30s into a Cold War context. And if you read Kennedy's speeches in, Cong in, in Congress throughout the late 40s and 50s, he consistently makes the argument on behalf of a tougher foreign policy towards 
uh, the Soviet Union and for higher levels of military spending. Every bill that came before Congress during his time in Congress in favour of a hike in military spending, he strongly supported. And so, basically, his views on foreign policy were pretty hard line. There is this story, which is kind of hushed up, but apparently true, in um, the early 1950s, where he went back to Harvard and, uh, for a dinner. And during the dinner, someone got up and said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm um, pleased that Joseph McCarthy, the Republican who was launch, launched this crusade against communists, I'm pleased that... Um, uh, yeah, he said, I'm pleased that Al Jahis, the, the, the convicted spy, didn't go to Harvard, but I'm even, I'm even uh, more pleased that uh, Joseph McCarthy didn't. And Kennedy, young Kennedy apparently got up fuming, saying, how dare you compare that, uh, that, 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 that traitor to a great American patriot, the traitor being Al Jahis, the great American patriot being McCarthy. Um, so his views on foreign policy were pretty hard line. This is the, I mean, this sounds like a, quite a, a bold assertion, but the biggest myth about JFK since his assass assassination um, it was the idea that he was a kind of uh, progressive liberal intent on ending the Cold War, pulling America out of Vietnam, advancing civil rights. He was in the same tradition as Franklin Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. He was actually pretty hardline on foreign policy and in terms of his overall political views in the center. Um, he once said in the 50s, I'm not a liberal. I never have been, I don't trust those people. And um, what is true is, and I'll talk more about this later, is in the final year of his life, he does change. I think in the final year of his life, in both foreign policy and domestic policy, he moves towards a more progressive liberal approach. But the basic point I want to make is before he runs for the presidency, before he becomes presidency, his views of, on foreign policy are pretty hard line. And you can see this also during the 1960 presidential campaign when he runs against his Republican opponent, Richard Nixon. And one of the big issues in the 60 campaign was Fidel Castro, because he'd come to power in 1959, the year before, and the big question was, you know, what do you do about Castro? And Nixon, of course, was part of the incumbent Eisenhower administration. Nixon was vice president at the time. And Kennedy made the argument that essentially the Eisenhower-Nixon administration had been too soft. And he pledged, if elected president, to adopt a more hardline approach in dealing with Castro in order to overthrow him. And once he's elected to the presidency, that is precisely what he proceeds to do. If you look at his policy towards Cuba in 61 and early 62, up to the point at which Khrushchev decides to put missiles in Cuba, his policy towards Cuba can be characterized in this way. He does everything he can to get rid of Castro, apart from a direct assault using American forces. But even that is retained as a policy option. The the most famous way in which JFK tries to overthrow Castro is the Bay of Pigs invasion. Now, this was a CIA plan to use Cuban exiles, Cubans who had been unhappy with Castro coming to power, had fled to Florida, was to take a group of Cuban exiles, fund them, train them, equip them in Guatemala, and then send them back in the, into Cuba, with the aim being to trigger a coup d'etat against Castro, to trigger an anti-Castro uprising. Uh, Kennedy is basically briefed about this operation during the 60 campaign, and the spring of 1961, he authorizes the Bay of Pigs invasion. It turns out to be a total fiasco, um, and the Cuban, ex, the Cuban emigre force is comprehensively defeated by Castro's forces. Kennedy had hoped that U.S. involvement, the CIA's involvement, would, re would remain a secret but it was immediately revealed to the press and at the United Nations and so on. And uh, it was seen as an embarrassing defeat for him, although it didn't really affect his uh, popularity. So that was one strand in the tapestry of JFK's anti-Castro policy in the early part of his presidency. A second, which is perhaps less, less well known, um, it's a slightly murky subject, it's sort of James Bond territory this, but the second element, was an attempt to assassinate Castro. Uh, we know about this because in 1975, the US Senate began an investigation into alleged assassination attempts, attempts against foreign leaders carried out by the CIA. And as part of those hearings in the Senate, there's a committee called the Church Committee, it was established that the CIA had devised at least eight plots 
to assassinate Castro between 1960 and 65. And uh, a number of those were during the Kennedy years. They actually originated in a series of schemes that the CIA devised in 1960, the year Ken before Kennedy became president, um, to tarnish Castro's reputation. So this is before Kennedy becomes president, but one, one scheme was to, uh, none of these were actually implemented, but one plan was to spray the studio Castro used for his radio broadcasts with a chemical that has the same effect as LSD. The idea was that when Castro gave his radio broadcast, his speech would become slurred, he would sound moronic, this would damage his credibility. Um, a, sec a second scheme was to try and dust thallium salts onto his uh, shoes. And what thallium salts do is they make all your hair drop out. Castro was known as the beard. That was his nickname. It was felt that some of his popularity with the Latin American peasantry was to do with the beard. So the idea was to get the beard to drop out and this would damage his credibility. <laughs> Um, and that evolved then into an attempt to assassinate Castro. It seems incredible, but this is the case. What basically happened is the CIA hired a former FBI agent, a guy called Robert Mahu, who in turn hired leading mobsters, Santos Traficante, John, Johnny Rosselli, and in particular, a guy called Sam Giancana, who was the head of the Chicago Mafia, the leading mobster in the country. And they hired them for two reasons. One, they're good at killing people, and uh, secondly, uh, they had extensive interests in the casinos in pre-Castro Havana and were interested in re-establishing those interests. It is an, that is an extraordinary thing, but basically the US government was hiring the mob to carry out US foreign policy. Uh, this, is, this is unquestionably what happened. And what's murky about it is the extent of Kennedy's knowledge and also the other presidents of that period, period because the CIA has a practice known as plausible deniability, which is even if a president is briefed about an assassination attempt, that's not something that is put in writing so that the president's knowledge is plausibly deniable at a later point in time. So you don't see declassified documents where Kennedy is, is being briefed about assassination attempts. But there's, a, I think that he unquestionably did know about the assassination attempts. It's very sad. I mean, in, in that 1975 Senate investigation, Tad Zulk, who was a journalist with the New York Times, uh, recalled a conversation he'd had with Kennedy in late 61, where Kennedy had told him, this is pretty much a verbatim quote, that he was under terrific pressure from intelligence officers to okay a Castro murder. Um, and also it would explain a lot, because if you look at the Bay of Pigs operation, it involved uh, 1,400, 1,500 anti-Castro Cubans, 1,500. Castro's got a militia of uh, 200,000 that he can call out, and he's got an army of 30,000. So why Kennedy thought 1,500 Cubans could possibly beat 230,000 Cubans is a mathematical question. And what would explain it is if you assume that Kennedy knew about the assassination attempts, because we know at least one and probably two assassination attempts were made at the time of the Bay of Pigs. Assume Kennedy did know about the assassination attempts then what he probably calculated was that Castro was going to be eliminated. And that would create a political vacuum, instability. And in that context, this small brigade of anti-Castro Cubans could be uh, effective. So that was another part of, the, um, of Kennedy's anti-Castro policies. It just wasn't Castro's time. Obviously, he survived. And um, I think one of the reasons he did was because he had very good sources in the Cuban exile community in Florida. And a lot of these plots involved uh, using Cuban exile, exiles from Florida. And uh, I mean, one of the, one, for example, so one of the plots was to uh, po poison the food at a restaurant that he frequented. And just before the plan was about to be implemented, Castro stopped going to that restaurant. He never went back. So he was clearly tipped off. Um, so you've got the Bay of Pigs to overthrow Castro. You've got the assassination attempts to kill him. Um, then in November 1961, seven months after the Bay of Pigs, you have Operation Mongoose. This was the centerpiece of Kennedy's policy towards Cuba for the following year. Operation Mongoose, not a lot of people know about it, it's lay public, but in fact, it was the biggest CIA operation in history up to its point, uh, up to that point in time. And the aim of Operation Mongoose was to overthrow Castro, sabotage this sort of thing, keep him off his stride, with the hope that you could trigger an anti-Castro uprising and then send in US forces to make sure it succeeded. So the Bay of Pigs was an attempt to overthrow Castro, assassination attempts uh, was a, uh, an effort to kill him, Operation Mongoose, also an attempt to overthrow Castro. 
Then in early 62, Cuba is kicked out of the Organization of American States, a body that links together the countries in the Western Hemisphere, um, in an attempt to diplomatically isolate him. In early 62, a strict economic embargo was imposed on Cuba. He had to bleed the Cuban economy dry. Kennedy authorized that. And also in spring of 62, just before Khrushchev made that decision to put missiles in Cuba, um, the US military staged practice military operations in the Caribbean. So for example, one of these practice operations, one of these military maneuvers, was the staging of an invasion of an island, VK, near Puerto Rico. And uh, one Soviet general later said that this had an influence on the decision to put missiles in Cuba. The Soviet leadership viewed this as a dry run for an actual invasion of Cuba. And those practice operations, those US uh, military maneuvers, would continue throughout the, re <coughs> the rest of the year. So just before the Cuban Missile Crisis, for example, uh, the US military announced that they were staging another military maneuver in the Caribbean. They announced that 40,000 US Marines would storm an island near Puerto Rico. And they said that the aim of this uh, practice operation was to liberate the island from a fictional dictator called Ortsak, O-R-T-S-A-C. Read that backwards, O-R-T-S-A-C, and you'll know who that was intended for. So, you know, what you can argue is if Khrushchev in the spring of 62 was very concerned that Kennedy was about to invade Cuba, um, was about to overthrow Castro, he had a lot of evidence for believing that was going to be the case. Bay of Pigs, uh, assassination attempts, which he seems to have suspected, Operation Mongoose, which he knew about, although not the precise name of the operation, economic sanctions, diplomatic pressure, those military maneuvers. So, you know, you can make this argument, you can make this argument that if it was not for Kennedy's hostile policies towards Cuba in 61 and early 62, Khrushchev would not have put missiles in Cuba and there would have been no Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, we don't know that. That's speculative. But it's an argument to consider. Now, that's not to justify Khrushchev's decision because that was risky and dangerous. Um, if Khrushchev was concerned about defending Castro, he could have done that just through the deployment of US troops. As I said, he, he did deploy US troops on the island of Cuba anyway, uh, over 40,000. I think in the end, that would have always been enough to deter a US attack on Cuba because any attack on Cuba would have meant the death of thousands of Soviet troops. Khrushchev then would have been obliged to respond somewhere, maybe Berlin, and you might have World War III. So probably the troops alone would have been enough to have deterred a US attack. So this, that argument is not to justify Khrushchev's missile deployment in Cuba. I said that, that, that Khrushchev made the case that there was a second reason why he deployed nuclear missiles in Cuba, and that was to change the nuclear balance, because the US had a huge nuclear, nuclear lead, and he wanted more missiles in Cuba that could strike American territory. <coughs> and again, you can make the argument, you know, you can make the argument that Kennedy's policies on defense, on nuclear weapons, played a role in influencing Khrushchev's thinking in the spring of 62, because one of the little known facts about Kennedy's presidency is he carried out the biggest peacetime increase in military spending in US history up to that point in time, to be exceeded by the Reagan years in the 80s. Um, and that, that was even though he'd inherited this huge nuclear lead over the Soviets. This was military spending on top of that. And it wasn't even just that. His predecessor, Dwight Eisenhower, was very cautious about revealing to the public and the world the extent of America's nuclear lead over the Soviets because he calculated, if I do this, then that's going to embarrass Khrushchev and it's going to force him to respond in kind by embarking on a huge military buildup. But the Kennedy administration was much less discreet and in late 1961, a Defense Department official, um, <coughs> Roswell Gilpatrick, did reveal the full extent of America's nuclear lead. And also in early 62, this seems astonishing, but it did happen in a press interview in early 62, Kennedy said that he could not rule out the possibility, at least the theoretical possibility, of a first strike, a first nuclear strike on the Soviet Union. The idea had always been that you would never use nuclear weapons to start a war. They were there as a deterrent to deter an adversary, in this case the Soviet Union, from attacking you. But what, well, Kennedy wasn't saying that he was 
that he wanted to carry out a nuclear attack on the Soviet Union. He was saying that there could possibly theoretically be circumstances where he would need to carry out a first nuclear strike on the Soviet Union. It's interesting, when he did that, the Soviet military went on special alert, and it was only a few weeks after that that Khrushchev decided to put missiles in Cuba. So <clears throat> I just put that argument out there for you to kind of mull over. Um, this is kind of a sequential argument. Had Kennedy not embarked, carried out a huge military buildup, had he not tried in a multiplicity of ways to overthrow Castro, then maybe Khrushchev would not have decided to put nuclear missiles in Cuba, and therefore you get no Cuban missile crisis. And therefore Kennedy played at least some role in causing the Cuban uh, missile crisis. And I say that is not to justify Khrushchev's missile gambit. Let me just, just before I get to the Cuban missile crisis, just let me move forward and talk very briefly about this period just before the Cuban missile crisis starts in the late summer and the autumn of 1962. Um, in congressional elections would take place in November 62. No presidential election, but congressional elections. And in the period from sort of August 62 to the start of the Cuban Missile Crisis, Cuba becomes a big domestic political issue in American politics. Republicans decide that they're gonna use Cuba to attack Kennedy in the lead up to the congressional elections. And for Republicans, there was a sense of you know, sweet revenge because Kennedy attacked Republicans over Cuba in the 60 presidential campaign. Now they were gonna do the same in the lead up to the congressional elections in 62. Now, the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba started in the summer of 62 and it was widely reported in the American press and it was discussed in Congress. Everyone knew about it. What people didn't know is that nuclear missiles were going in there. The first ones didn't go in until sort of early mid-September. But uh, the fact that the Soviet military buildup was taking place was, was, was reported on. And Republicans used it to attack Kennedy. They said, look, this huge Soviet military buildup is taking place on the island of Cuba, just off the coast, coast of uh, Florida. What is Kennedy doing about it? And so this is a domestic political issue for Kennedy to grapple with. And so what he does is he, 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 this is important to how the Cuban Missile Crisis plays out. He issues public statements, statements to the press on September the 4th and September the 13th, 1962. And what he, the argument he makes is this. He said, you know, the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba is not desirable, but the important thing is it doesn't involve any nuclear missiles. So it can't actually threaten the United States. It's not really a major national security interest the Republicans are just making political capital out of this, but it doesn't really threaten the United States. He thought he could say that with confidence because the Soviet, Soviet officials were telling him off the record secretly that they weren't going to put any missiles in. They, they, uh, well, in some cases they were lying to him, in some cases the Soviet officials actually didn't know that they were going in. Um, when the Cuban Missile Crisis begins, one option for Kennedy could have been just to accept the Soviet missiles on the basis of well, you know, they've got missiles in the Soviet Union that can strike American territory anyway, so what strategic difference does it make that they've got missiles in Cuba that can strike American territory? They're not, in fact, McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, actually made that argument. Um, but Kennedy always felt he couldn't, he couldn't do that because of those public statements in September when he'd said, what he said was, this is not a big deal because no missiles are going in. And of but of course, if nuclear missiles do go in, then I will take robust action to deal with that threat. He felt he had tied his credibility in September to taking strong action should, so, should Soviet missiles be deployed. So when he found out in the Cuban Missile Crisis that the Soviets had put missiles in Cuba, he felt that he had to respond in a strong fashion. Okay, so that was the first thing I said I wanted to talk about, the background to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Let me get to the Cuban Missile Crisis itself. Uh, the missile crisis itself divides into two, uh, two weeks. There's the, there's the first week, which lasts from the 16th of October to the 22nd of October, which is the secret phase, the private phase of the Cuban Missile Crisis. So this is when Kennedy and his advisors know there are missiles in Cuba. They know they're going to respond some way, but they're not telling anyone. They're not telling the press, they're not telling Congress, and they're certainly not telling Khrushchev, because they want to make the decision about what to do and then announce it to the world which is what Kennedy does on the evening of the 22nd of October in a big speech on television and via radio when he tells the American people, tells the world, world two things. He says, one, you need to know that there are Soviet nuclear missiles in Cuba 
and two, I'm responding by establishing a naval blockade around Cuba to stop the Soviet missiles on ships. At that point, the Cuban Missile Crisis goes public. And so the next week, the world has this feeling that you know, nuclear war is a possibility, and Kennedy and Khrushchev, amidst a blaze of publicity, try and navigate a path towards a peaceful settlement. The, um, what's really great from the point of view of you know, the historian with the Cuban Missile Crisis are the sources that we now have, because what we know, but almost none of Kennedy's advisers uh, knew, was that Kennedy was recording, secretly recording the meetings between himself and his advisers as they discussed what to do. What he decided at the start of the Cuban Missile Crisis was to convene a series of meetings with high-level foreign policy officials, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, so on and so forth, and um, so that they could give him options, they could give him advice on how to handle this crisis. And he had a little button under his desk and he could just press it, and that button triggered a taping device um, I'm not sure, actually sure where it was. It may be in the light fixtures or the curtains, whatever. But we have those tapes. We have those tapes. And they've been transcribed. So we have a very precise sense of what Kennedy and his advisers said. None of his advisers knew that, apart from his brother, Bobby Kennedy, Attorney General, his closest advisor, who no, no doubt knew. So, I don't know, for me, the interesting thing about that is... If you look at JFK's performance during the missile crisis, is there's a performative aspect to it. There's got to be some kind of performative aspect. He knows he's being recorded, and he knows that those tapes are being bequeathed to posterity. I mean, you still have to assume what he says is what he believes, but there is a, element, there's a performative element to it. Now, the, um, I think there are two basic points I want to make about the Cuban Missile Crisis. One relates to John F. Kennedy, and one relates to Bobby Kennedy. Um, with, with John Kennedy, and I'll come back to this point in a moment, is I think in general he handled the Cuban Missile Crisis very well. And in terms of my own work on Kennedy, one of the themes that I've, that I've developed, one of the arguments I've made, is that what JFK was very good at was at dealing with short-term crisis, crisis situations. Not only the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, but the Berlin Crisis in 1961, the periodic civil rights crises of his presidency. He, he, he just had an ability to remain cool under pressure and to think nimbly on his feet. Um, what he was less good at was at thinking long term. Um, so, he, he, yeah, I, I don't think he was sort of a profound thinker about the world and international affairs, but he was good at thinking on his feet. So if you look at, at some of the long term implications of his decisions, they're much less impressive than his crisis management. He massively escalated U.S. involvement in Vietnam, 600 U.S. military officials in South Vietnam at the start of his presidency, 600, 17,000 by the time he's assassinated. Of course, that made it much harder for a successor to extricate himself from Vietnam. Huge military buildup I talked about, which in the end, I mean, the huge military buildup that he authorized in the end reduced America's lead because how were the Soviets going to respond? That was not hard to predict. They responded by embarking on a huge military buildup of their own. So as I said earlier, by the 70s, they have approximately speaking equality with the US in terms of military power. Kennedy's military policies paradoxically reduced America's nuclear lead. So this is, this is one thing I feel about Kennedy is he, he wasn't very good at thinking long term. Um, but he was good at dealing with short-term crisis situations, including the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, and I'll come back to that idea in a moment. The second thing relates to Bobby Kennedy, because Bobby Kennedy is a key figure in all of this. For one thing, for many years, his account of the Cuban Missile Crisis was something that historians relied upon, because in 1968, if you remember the history here, in 1968, he had left the Johnson administration. His brother had been assassinated in 63. He left the Johnson administration... And in 68, he ran for the presidency. He ran for the Democratic presidential nomination. And then in June 68, on the night that he won the California primary, as he ran for the Democratic presidential nomination in order to run for the presidency, he was assassinated. What he had been doing prior to that was putting together a memoir on the Cuban Missile Crisis called 13 Days. And it was published posthumously. And for many years, historians relied a lot on... 13 days for their understanding of the Cuban Missile Crisis. If you read 13 Days, what it suggests is that basically, along with his brother, Bobby Kennedy, is the hero of the Cuban Missile Crisis. You always have to be very careful with memoirs. They tend to be self-serving. And this was the argument that Bobby Kennedy made. And he, 
he basically said, look, in the first week of the Cuban Missile Crisis, there were two schools of thought within the Kennedy administration. There were the Hawks, the military, the CIA, other officials who wanted to attack Cuba. They wanted to bomb Cuba, maybe even invade Cuba to destroy the missile sites. And then there were the doves, the people who said, no, 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 that's too dangerous. It's too dangerous. We should go instead with a naval blockade. And what Bobby Kennedy said, what Robert Kennedy said in his memoir, 13 Days, is that I was the one, I was the one who, fought, who, who led the fight against the belligerent hawks in the Kennedy administration uh, and argued in favour of the blockade. And he also said that he had made a moralistic argument against the hawks, that he'd, he'd basically said, you know, we cannot, as the military want to, we cannot attack Cuba. We cannot, cannot carry out an invasion. We cannot carry out an airstrike because this is not something which is consonant with American uh, values, morality, and virtues. It would be like, he said, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. That's how indefensible a US attack would be on this smaller power, Cuba. And he said that that argument won the day, it convinced people, and in the end it convinced JFK, and JFK then decides to go for a blockade rather than an attack. If you look at all the records we now have, including those secret tapes of the meetings, um, it's clear that that is a massive distortion of what happened. For one thing, at the start of the missile crisis, Bobby Kennedy, in fact, was a hawk himself, a super hawk. That is, he actually wanted an invasion of Cuba. And there was even like jokes about, you know, maybe we can make Bobby mayor of Havana when this is all over. And um, he, he, he is not the person who suggests the blockade. In fact, that is the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara. And he is not the person who comes up with this clever Pearl Harbor metaphor, an attack on Cuba is unjustifiable because it would be like the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Several other people thought of that metaphor, including George Ball, who was a State Department official uh, and would later famously be the one official in, the, in Lyndon Johnson's, Johnson's administration who opposed going to war in Vietnam and told Johnson it was a huge mistake. At this point in the missile crisis, he makes the argument that the US attack would be wrong, it would be like Pearl Harbor. So what Bobby Kennedy did is he, kept, he did keep an open mind and he changed his opinions. He switched from being a hawk to supporting the blockade. He took the arguments made by others, this Pearl Harbor argument, and began to use it himself. So his contribution is important, and of course, he has a major influence on his brother because they're so close. But his contribution to the management of the Cuban Missile Crisis and saving the peace uh, was massively exaggerated by himself uh, in that memoir, 13, 13 Days. His role is still an important one, and in general, a constructive one. But I think the point is the... The US management of the Cuban Missile Crisis was a collaborative effort, it was a team effort. Bobby Kennedy's role was important, but the role of other US officials was important as well. Um, and you can also see this in the second week of the Cuban Missile Crisis as well, I'm just moving towards the end of the talk now, but um, it, with the, in the second week of the Cuban Missile Crisis, it all comes to a head on the 26th and the 27th of October. This is the climax of the Cuban Missile Crisis. The important thing that happens here is, Kennedy and Khrushchev, from the 22nd of October onwards, are exchanging correspondence, they're exchanging letters. And on the 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25th, if you read the letters between Kennedy and Khrushchev, they're basically all the same. They basically just say, it's your fault, you need to back down. That's basically the, the, the sort of thrust of their arguments in their correspondence. But on the, 26th, on the 26th of October, Nikita Khrushchev's letter to Kennedy actually proposes a deal, a way out of this crisis and a possible nuclear nightmare. It's a very interesting letter because if you read correspondence between great power leaders, they tend to be very formal. This was a deeply personal, deeply emotional letter. Khrushchev talked about the horrors of war and said he'd lived through three world wars and he, and he knew firsthand the horror of war. And um, he proposed a way out. And th this is the deal he offered. He said, you promise not to invade Cuba and we'll take the missiles away from the island. It seemed like the basis of a possible settlement. The problem is, the following morning, the morning of Saturday, the 27th of October, before Kennedy, before JFK had had a chance to respond, a second letter arrived from Khrushchev, and very different in tone, much more formal. Um, and he also again offered a deal, but it was a different deal, 
and it involved more US concessions. He said, you know, we'll take the missiles out of Cuba if you promise not to invade Cuba, but also if you promise to remove US nuclear missiles from Turkey. He was demanding an additional concession. And this impaled Kennedy, JFK and his advisors on the horns of a dilemma, which is, you know, what do we do about this? How do we respond to these two different sets of offers? I mean, what the, how do you explain it? Why did he do this, Khrushchev? And it's still a mystery to historians. Um, Soviet intelligence may have had a role in this. Um, and, uh, well, you know, maybe I'll come back to that. Maybe not. But um, this is the problem, how to deal with it. In the end, what JFK decided to do was to respond to the first letter quite clever, respond to the first letter, just sort of kind of ignore the, ignore the second. So, so, he, so on the 27th of October, Kennedy, JFK replied to these two different letters, two different sets off from Khrushchev, where he said, I, I really appreciated your letter on the 26th, the first letter, and I think this is a basis for a settlement. I'll promise not to invade Cuba, you remove the missiles. Now, privately, secretly, he also had Bobby Kennedy go to the Soviet ambassador, Debrinin, and said, we want you to know off the, off the record, off the record, we will remove our missiles from Turkey, which JFK didn't mind doing. They were te technically speaking, they were junk, they were kind of obsolete. Um, and he'd, he'd thought about getting rid of them before the missile crisis anyway. Uh, but what Bobby Kennedy said is this has to be an, a secret part of the settlement. It can't appear in public that, that, like we're bowing to Soviet pressure and making this kind of concession that could be construed as appeasement. So that has to remain a secret component in the settlement, but that will happen. So that's how Kennedy, um, Kennedy responded to this dilemma of these two different letters, two different sets of offers from Khrushchev. Now, at this point in time, the, the tension really was beginning to mount, and this is one of the most extraordinary elements in the Cuban Missile Crisis, and we only found out about this in the 1990s, 30 years after the event, which is um, late at night, uh, as October the 26th moved into the early hours of October the 27th. Fidel Castro remained awake. And he began to write a letter to Khrushchev. And what he said to Khrushchev was, we now fear, we the Cuban government, fear the probability of a US attack on Cuba. We think it's going to happen within 24 to 72 hours. We think it's most likely to be a US airstrike on Cuba. But we think there is a possibility it could be a full-scale invasion. If it's a full-scale invasion, then what I recommend is that you respond with a nuclear attack on the United States. Uh, sounds amazing, but we have the letter. And when this was declassified in the 1990s, this was sort of front page news and people were staggered. But, you know, I think from the 26th onwards, Khrushchev you know, does play a major role in diffusing the crisis. He's concerned that there could be war. Um, but this is probably one contributory factor the sense that he had that his closest ally in the crisis was losing his cool. And probably played a role in his desire to end the crisis quickly. On the 28th of October, Khrushchev wrote back to Kennedy, replying to Kennedy's letter of the 27th, saying, I accept the terms that you propose in your letter, which is that you will issue a no invasion pledge concerning Cuba. You will promise not to invade Cuba. And we, for our part, will withdraw the nuclear missiles from Cuba. The Cuban Missile Crisis ended that morning on Sunday the 28th of October. The most dangerous crisis of the Cold War had come to an end after 13 days. Um, I'll just close by talking briefly about its impact on Kennedy and Khrushchev. We know that two years later, Khrushchev was overthrown, in, basically in a coup in Moscow. And you know, in the communist world, this was portrayed as a defeat for Khrushchev. He'd sent missiles to Cuba. He'd ended up having to withdraw those missiles. And that was seen as, a, as an embarrassment, as a political defeat. And it damages Khrushchev's credibility in the Soviet Union within, within the communist world and probably plays a role in his fall from power. For Kennedy, it bolsters his credibility. It's seen as a huge foreign policy success. And you know, I think that's fair enough. He did handle the crisis. His policies towards Cuba before the crisis leave a lot to be desired. But during the crisis, he basically handled it well. Like his brother, the first day or two, he was in, he was in favor of a US attack on Cuba. But as the crisis went on, he became more uh, moderate and he became more determined to end the crisis diplomatically. And uh, you know, 
this was, I think, his major contribution during the missile crisis, which is, you know, this isn't just sort of Oliver Stone hyperbole. He was under a lot of pressure from his own military to attack Cuba throughout the crisis. And he consistently had to stand up to his own military and say that he was not going to press ahead with an attack on Cuba. And that took a certain you know, courage and independence of thought. Um, for me, the really interesting thing about the Cuban Missile Crisis is how it changes Kennedy. And I'll just finish with this, um, with JFK during the final year of his presidency of his life, because of course he dies 13 months later with the assassination in Dallas, the 50th anniversary for which is coming up this, this November. Two things happen to JFK in the final year of his life that really change him as a politician. As I said, he, he was, his views on foreign policy were pretty hard line, and you can trace that all the way back to why England slept the late 1930s, his views on foreign policy at that formative moment. Um, and on domestic policy, some historians feel he could have done more to promote civil rights and racial equality and so on, because of course there was still racial segregation in the American South at that time. But two events happened in the final year of his life which changed him. We're all affected by experiences in life, and Kennedy was no different. And the, the experiences he had as president changed him. And I think there are two that are really important. One is the civil rights crisis in Birmingham, Alabama in the spring of 1963, when Martin Luther King, other civil rights leaders, organized peaceful protests in Birmingham, Alabama. And they, those peaceful protesters are ruthlessly attacked by the local police commissioner, a man called Bull Connor, who's a thug of the worst sort. Uh, he, he attacked the peaceful protesters with dogs, electric cattle prods, high-powered water hoses. This is all filmed, um, pictures in the American press. And this is the moment when a lot of Americans became really aware of the civil rights issue in the South. And Kennedy himself said he felt sickened. He felt sickened by what, by what happened in Birmingham. And a few months later, he gives a speech, June 1963, five months before he dies, he gives a speech to the American people on race in America in which he said that the issue of racial equality was not just a political issue, it wasn't just a legalistic issue, it was a moral issue. It was a basic issue of right and wrong, of morality. He was the first president in the 20th century to define the issue of race as a moralistic issue. And following on from that, he introduced a civil rights bill to end racial segregation in the South. It didn't pass Congress during his lifetime, but it passed in 1964 as the 1964 Civil Rights Act ending segregation in the South. Um, I think it's the single most important piece of legislation passed in 20th century American history. Birmingham deepened Kennedy's commitment to equality and, and, and civil rights reform. And the Cuban Missile Crisis changes Kennedy's view of the world and of the Cold War. He understands the dangers, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, he understands the dangers of the possibility of a nuclear holocaust. It's one thing to understand that in a theoretical, abstract way. It's another thing to live through the Cuban Missile Crisis when you have the primary responsibility as to whether the world's going to endure. And he becomes more determined to find ways to diffuse Cold War tensions and to make the world safer. And if you look at the final year of his life, you have Kennedy authorising the establishment of a hotline between Moscow and Washington, between the Kremlin and the White House, for immediate rapid communication between the Kremlin and the White House. You have him signing the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty to limit nuclear testing, the first such agreement in the history of the Cold War. And you also have Kennedy delivering, um, I think in a way, the most amazing speech of his presidency, the American University speech in June 1963, which you can, you know, you can look at uh, online if you're interested. Uh, Khrushchev described it as the greatest speech by an American president since the days of Franklin Roosevelt. What JFK said in that speech, and I think the Cuban Missile Crisis is a subtext of what he says in the speech is that the American people should change their attitude towards the Cold War and towards the Russian people. He says, you know, no political system can be considered as being so nefarious that its people must be regarded as lacking in virtue. And he talked about making the world a safer place and reducing Cold War tensions. So, you know, with the assassination in Dallas, there's a, it's a huge personal tragedy. You know, a, a man cut down in his prime, uh, a children who lose their father, uh, a wife who loses her husband. But there's also that political tragedy as well that you can argue in the final year of his life, 
Kennedy was really maturing, changing, becoming more deeply committed to important things like equality in American society and making the Cold War a safer place. And so that made the tragedy in, in Dallas uh, an even more painful experience. Thank you very much.